Since February 1965, our military operations have included selective bombing of military targets in North Vietnam. Our purposes are three, to back our fighting men by denying the enemy a sanctuary, to exact a penalty against North Vietnam for her flagrant violations of the Geneva Accords of 1954 and 1962, to limit the flow or to substantially increase the cost of infiltration of men and material from North Vietnam. By early February 1967, it was apparent that the communists were waging a systematic campaign to halt the bombing in North Vietnam without a mutual scaling down of their own military actions. We're willing to go to a conference room any day where you're ready to go without stopping or after stopping if they are willing to do likewise or if they're willing to make any concession. But I don't think it's fair to ask an American commander-in-chief to say to your men, ground your planes, tie your hands behind you, sit there and watch division after division come across the DMZ, and don't to hit them until they get in a mile or two out of them. I don't think that's fair to American Marines or American soldiers. On 8 February, American bombers remained on their pads and carrier decks during a four-day truce honoring Tet, the Lunar New Year. As the year of the GOAT was ushered in, it was accompanied by an unprecedented flurry of peace rumors. Speculation ran high. Would this be just another brief ceasefire followed by a resumption of heavy fighting? Or might the truce be extended in hopes of opening the way to peace negotiations? For a while, it appeared that there was something in the wind. As most of the world listened hopefully for something tangible amid the mass of misinformation, vague hints, and expressions of desire, one true signal was made. The president, with a sense of urgency, had written a letter to his opposite number, President Ho Chi Minh of North Vietnam. He had proposed a mutual cessation of hostilities and serious and private discussions that would lead toward an early peace. The letter had been sent in secret to avoid any glare of publicity that might pressure either side. The reply was equally precise and to the point. Ho Chi Minh rebuffed the president rejecting the mutual cessation of hostilities. If the United States wanted to talk, they must unconditionally stop the bombing and all other acts of war. It was now doubly clear that Hanoi was either not receiving the American message or was confident that military victory might still be possible. To dispel any doubts once and for all as to the position of the United States in Vietnam, President Johnson would, in the weeks to come, spell out American policy from every forum he could find. From the hills of Tennessee to a rain-logged island 8,000 miles from Washington. If the January weather in Washington had been unseasonably warm, February made up for it. One of the most crippling snowstorms of the century paralyzed the East Coast. In spite of over 13 inches of snow, it was business as usual for official Washington. The chief executive set an example for the hundreds of departments and agencies under him by pressing forward with the day's business on schedule. First on the agenda, receiving credentials from newly appointed ambassadors. If the severity of the East Coast winter was a shock to the ambassador from the Yemen Arab Republic, it was old hat to the ambassador from Malta, Arvid Pardo. Ambassador Pardo has served with distinction in past years as the ambassador to the United Nations for the mission of Malta. Helping Vietnam preserve her freedom of self-determination may have overshadowed many a lesser news item during February, but of equal importance and at the root of democracy and self-determination is the freedom of inquiry. Not only must it be guarded, but it must be extended. In the East Room of the White House, the President did both. 
He presented the nation's highest award for science to 11 men who had dedicated their lives to enriching the lives of their fellow men. By the 9th of February, the weather had lifted. The timing was perfect, for it enabled the President and Mrs. Johnson to offer a warmer reception to one of America's oldest friends. This was the second time that King Hassan II of Morocco had visited the United States, and the first time that President Johnson was afforded an opportunity to welcome him. To America, Morocco is not only an ancient friend, but a modern partner as well. Following American industrial, economic, and agricultural lead, the young monarch seeks to assure each of his people a life of dignity and value. King Hassan also assured the president that he was doing his utmost to strengthen the basis for democracy in Morocco and to guarantee his people their freedom. Knowing that King Hassan is fond of ballet, the president and Mrs. Johnson arranged for a performance of The Moor's Pavilion, a modern dance based upon the classic Othello tragedy. On the 14th of February, the President and Mrs. Johnson welcomed yet another Chief of State to the White House. This time, a prophet whom the world once ignored at a high cost, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. The president remarked in a toast to the emperor that the betrayal of Ethiopia was a turning point on the road to aggression and war. Its lesson has been etched into our memory and has spurred us in building a world where solid commitments are no longer just scraps of paper.
At that moment on 14 February, no commitment was more firm than America's stand in Vietnam. Having extended the Tet bombing pause for nearly two days and having received no productive response from Hanoi, the president had ordered the bombers once again into their northern attack routes. Looking beyond the bombing, beyond the DMZ, beyond the cessation of hostilities, what was the long-term future of Vietnam? To help block out the picture, the president asked David Lilienthal to go to Vietnam and take a preliminary look at the development potential. Robert Comer, special assistant to the president, joined the legendary developer on his trip. Comer reported on the progress of the other war, the building of roads, the economic outlook, the political momentum. Mr. Lilienthal assured the president that the productive resources of Vietnam, especially those in the Delta, were fantastic. They could change the economic complexion of the whole country. In a day when the palace coup is a common political maneuver, America's orderly procedures in transferring power stand as an example to the world. Even though the system has worked for nearly 180 years, the Constitution has left room for doubt and anxiety on some specific situations. On the 23rd of February, the President removed a large portion of this anxiety by signing into law the 25th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Ratified by the states earlier in the month, the amendment covers many of the problems that arise when the chief executive becomes disabled. And for the first time, the Constitution provides for the replacement of a vice president should it be necessary for him to assume the powers of the presidency. Throughout February and March, the president met with congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle. He sought an effective partnership between the executive and legislative branches a partnership that would build upon the social and economic progress that had already been hammered into law by the 88th and 89th Congresses. He pressed forward with a series of messages calling for laws that would protect the consumer, continue the war against rural and urban poverty, strengthen his education and health programs, chart a new course in foreign aid, and fight crime in all aspects. The newspaper the other day carried a story of the brutal murder of a young man. He was a college student, 20 years old, who had just made the honors list. He was accosted at night a few blocks from his school in Brooklyn by a band of four other youths. They demanded cigarettes. And when the students said he had none, one of the group stabbed him in the chest. And that young man, whose life was bright with promise, died there on that city street. The tragic story the president this related was all too familiar to the readers of American newspapers. To the National Conference of Crime America Control, it was but another of an ever-increasing list of sobering statistics. Of in a dinner speech to the 700 members of the conference, the president urged for passage of his Safe Streets and Crime Control Act. Public order. I said to the Congress in my message on crime in America, public order is the first business of government. So I have come here to meet with you tonight because we are allies in the maintenance of public order. We share a trust which this nation has reposed in us. So together, let us make it clear beyond the possibility or peradventure of doubt, our disbelief, that given the weapons we need, our war on crime in this great country of ours, from this hour on, from this night on, with this little guard of courageous and enlightened leaders, this war on crime will be unremitting. Thank you and good night.
On the same day, Mrs. Johnson ushered in the spring season by dedicating a gift to the children of Washington. Bright south of the border colors provided a clue to the donor, Mrs. Diaz Ordaz, the first lady of Mexico. Improprieties on the part of the audience would have to be forgiven, for the youngsters were impatient to get on with the show. We've come here today to honor the courage of a very brave soldier. His was a very special kind of courage, the unarmed heroism of compassion and service to others. The conduct of Specialist Six, Lawrence Joel, reflects, I believe, the role America itself must play on every battlefield of freedom. Wounded twice, Specialist Joel crawled for more than 12 hours through unceasing enemy fire to bring others of his fellow man to safety. It is a terrible truth that suffering is so often the price of freedom. But freedom is indivisible. To protect it in distant Asia is to maintain it here in America. 1967, according to On the 9th of March, the president held his 98th news conference. He cited evidence that the economic pressures of the past year had eased. So the actions that we took last fall with the cooperation of the Congress have helped to do what we thought very much needed to be done. The imbalance in our economy that we were aiming at has now been righted. We said that we would restore the tax incentives when appropriate and when the suspension was no longer needed. The suspension is no longer needed, and I propose that we restore the investment incentives. The president's eagerness to go more than halfway in seeking peace negotiations was implicit in the letter he had sent to Ho Chi Minh. But neither this letter nor Ho Chi Minh's reply could be revealed. Each day, we were ready to speak unconditionally or conditionally, and the problem is, with all of those who love peace, and I think most of us do, is not with this government. I see nothing in any evidence that I have that would give me any indication that they've had a change of mind or that they're willing to take any serious action to stop this war. I'm searching every day. I'm following every lead I can. I hope that we'll find something uh, uh, the beginning of every week but I can't give you any assurance now. Viewers if the road to peace negotiations seemed distant and discouraging, 
the president could take satisfaction in the progress of the other war, the slow but sure shaping of a political, free, economically sound Vietnam. I do think that uh, uh, Mr. Comer brought back an optimistic appraisal of uh, the situation in Vietnam. I think that we've made great progress there. It's been only 18 months since we sent our troops there. I don't think we can expect uh, any quick overnight uh, success story. But uh, I will be receiving a report uh, sometime later this month from both uh, General Westmoreland in person and from Ambassador Lodge and from Mr. Porter and all of those engaged in Vietnam. And we meet about every six months and we will uh, uh, review in some detail uh, uh, our weaknesses out there and their legion as well as our strengths. But I'm very proud of uh, what the United States government has been able to do in the last 18 months in that area, and I'm very sure of victory, and I'm very grateful to the men who are uh, making sacrifices to bring it about. Our ambassador, our ambassador Lodge and General Westmore are coming here for a conference. No, I expect we'll meet them in the Pacific area somewhere. I would expect it would be perhaps sometime this month. On the following day, at the White House, the President met a group of men who were making daily sacrifices in Vietnam. Not in bombing, nor in pacification, but in an unusual war of their own. In the midst of enemy fire, these men reached out and brought back to safety, from the jungles, from the mountains, and from the seas, their comrades who had been downed in combat. Their motto, that others may live. Seven members of the group had already given their lives in pursuit of that maxim. The president paid tribute by awarding the presidential unit citation to the 3rd Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Group. The 10th of March was a satisfying day for the president. Not only was he able to commend the nation's best, but he saw the son of an old friend from Texas rise to new ranks in the government. Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark administered the oath to his son, Ramsey, now the 65th Attorney General. On March 14th, the United States was not only standing firm in Vietnam, but was again demonstrating her flexibility, her willingness to negotiate if constructive proposals were put forth. Ambassador Arthur Goldberg relayed a new formula for peace to the president, a formula drawn up by Secretary General Wu Thant. On March 15th, under Secretary Rust and Ambassador Goldberg's direction, we promptly replied, welcoming the proposal and noting that it contained constructive and positive elements toward bringing a peaceful settlement of the Vietnam conflict. It would be three days before the United States would formally reply to Uthan's proposal, but the proposal was acknowledged to be a serious one and workable. It would have the full consideration of the administration. None of the great society ventures hold more promise for the nation's future nor is closer to Lyndon Johnson than those involving education. Pancho Mancera is living proof of this. He is symbolic of all children who, through Head Start and Teacher Corps, are being given a real chance in life. On the 13th of March, Pancho helped Mrs. Johnson launch her education tour, Adventures in Learning. Today is an important one for me because it marks the beginning of a journey I am taking to some of the classrooms of this country. A journey that will take me during the next three days to West Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. The map shows that this area, Appalachia, lies deep in the heart of the nation. It is no less deep in the heart and the thoughts of the president. In Charleston, West Virginia, Mrs. Johnson met the first of what she called the flesh and blood statistics that lay behind the 18 education bills that Lyndon Johnson had signed into law. Her home for most of the next three days would be, appropriately enough, one that is a familiar sight to any rural school child. First stop, the Sunrise Cultural Center. Field trips to museums, planetariums, and art galleries, like Sunrise, 
may be the only exposure to creativity many disadvantaged children have throughout their school life. And the same federal programs that make these trips possible also provide for some more basic necessities. Sound nourishment, a well-rounded daily diet, and even medical and dental care. Following a late evening tour through a variety of family educational projects, Mrs. Johnson departed for North Carolina. She concluded her first day on the road with a visit to the home of Thomas Wolfe, one of America's greatest writers. On the following day, she would plunge into the heart of Appalachia, seeing firsthand not only the legendary poverty that grips the land, but the hand of opportunity reaching out to help. Pancho comes from California, but he has his counterparts on the East Coast and in the Southern Hills. The Ponchos, wherever they may live, can all be reached. At her next stop, Mrs. Johnson would see some of the specific methods used to give them a chance. visiting some of the classrooms of these three states, I will be glimpsing classrooms in every state where we are attacking old problems in new ways. There is a great new fever for learning in this country and a greater commitment by government to wipe out illiteracy than ever before. At Western Carolina College, Mrs. Johnson concluded her second day of the trip by dedicating a new library made possible by federal aid to education. Over the years, perhaps the sharpest single distinction between America and the other nations of the world has been this. We have regarded education as a right, not a privilege. Through free public education, we have helped all men to rise to their fullest measure. As the press followed Mrs. Johnson through the Southern Mountains, a parallel story was developing. The president had announced that he would meet Ambassador Lodge and General Westmoreland the following weekend in Guam, and in a surprise move, would join Mrs. Johnson the next day in Tennessee. columnist remarked that it was like old times again. After several months of intensive work, largely behind closed doors in the White House, he had once again put on his seven-league boots and was on the move. This morning I visited the Hermitage, the historic home of Andrew Jackson. Two centuries have passed since that most American of all Americans was born. The world has changed a great deal since his day but the qualities which sustain men and nations in positions of leadership have not changed. In our time, as in his, history conspires to test the American will. In our time, as in Jackson's time, courage and vision and the willingness to sacrifice will sustain the cause of freedom.
Moments later, before a joint session of the Tennessee State Legislature, the president made a detailed and comprehensive summary of the war. He made it clear that America's stand in Vietnam could be a cornerstone for an independent Asia, full of promise for her long-suffering peoples. But if we faltered, the forces of chaos would scent victory, and decades of strife and aggression would stretch endlessly before us. The choice was clear. We would stay the course, and we shall stay the course. Two days before the president was due to arrive in Guam, he instructed Ambassador Arthur Goldberg to deliver America's formal reply to Uthant's peace proposal. We promptly told the Secretary General that we would be consulting immediately with the government of South Vietnam and with our other allies, and that we would provide him with a full and a very prompt reply. On March 15th, we said that. On March 18th, Ambassador Goldberg delivered that reply. It was uh, positive. It was definitive. It was affirmative. With America and her allies backing Uthan's most recent proposal, it now remained for the United Nations to hear from Hanoi. This would not happen during the Guam conference. The president chose Guam as the site for the meeting as a convenience to those conducting the military and the peaceful development campaigns in Vietnam. But beyond that consideration, the president remarked, there is a historical significance to the island that stirs the memory. Arriving only moments after the president, Chairman Thu and Prime Minister Key stepped out on American soil. They had met in Hawaii in February of 1966. Talks then were of plans and hopes. And now, over a year later, the atmosphere is one of progress. It would be the common task of both President Johnson and leaders of the Republic of Vietnam to extend that progress and in the conference rooms on Guam to chart the course for the future of Vietnam. Spectacular disclosures, sudden solutions, major military moves were not the purpose of the meeting. It was conceived as a working conference, whereby the leaders of both governments could exchange their views face to face across the table. Discussions delved into the military front, where the initiative was lying more and more with the Allied forces. They reviewed the pacification and revolutionary development programs. One indication that these programs were succeeding was the increased Viet Cong efforts to intimidate and terrorize the teens. 
They studied the initial plans for long-range economic development initiated by David Lilienthal and his Vietnamese counterpart. President Johnson introduced a new team of representatives for the American mission in Saigon. Succeeding Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, who had served with distinction for two tours of duty, would be Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker. Known as a troubleshooter, Ambassador Bunker gained worldwide attention in his handling of the Dominican crisis in 1965. Special Assistant Robert Comer would be assigned to Saigon to give attention to pacification matters. The highlight of the conference, however, was the completion of the Vietnamese Constitution. Premier Key presented a copy to the President, assuring him that it would be promulgated shortly and would be followed by a presidential election in less than six months. We came here to discuss seven of our major concerns in Vietnam today. First, the military progress of the war, both in the South and in the North. Second, the political progress that's being made in South Vietnam. Third, we discussed in some detail the morale and the health and the training and the food and the clothing and the equipment of our superb young fighting men. Fourth, the, nice the talks at Guam had not only underscored President Johnson's determination to stay the course in Vietnam, but it served, too, as a pledge that the United States and her allies would continue their quest for an honorable peace. And we feel refreshed by the conviction that on every front, military, political, and social, we and our allies are making substantial progress. When the inevitability of that progress finally gets through and becomes clear to Hanoi, we shall then arrive at what Churchill would have called the beginning of the end. The month of March was virtually over. Among the major items on the agenda awaiting the president's return was the Counselor Treaty with Russia. After considerable debate, the Senate had ratified it with a vote of 66 to 28, thus endorsing the bridge-building policy of Lyndon Johnson's administration. The first bilateral treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union, the pact sets guidelines for the resumption of consular relations, broken off when the Cold War intensified in 1948. On March the 28th, the President welcomed the Prime Minister of Afghanistan to the White House. He knew then that neither peace nor peace negotiations would be forthcoming in the immediate days ahead. At a luncheon honoring the Prime Minister later that day, the President commented on North Vietnam's reply to Uthan's peace proposal. Yesterday, we regretfully learned from Radio Hanoi that they were informing the world that they apparently were not prepared to accept the Secretary General's proposal. They stated, and I quote to their radio, the Vietnam problem has no concern with the United Nations, and the United Nations has absolutely no right to interfere in any way with the Vietnam question. We respectfully disagree. War and peace are concerns of the United Nations. They are concerns of all people. And we welcome the efforts of not only the United Nations, but any nation, large or small, if they have any suggestion or any contribution they're prepared to make. I want everyone who can hear my voice or see my words to know that this nation will continue to persist. <laughs>